Here's Rick Rubin and Adria Petty. The interesting thing about the podcast for me is that for people that I know, I get to ask them about stuff that we that just never comes up in normal life. Yeah. So like, what was it like growing up in the house with Tom and your mom? What was that like? It was weird. I mean, it's been a lot of time to reflect on it. At the beginning, it was really exciting because I was born right when the Heartbreakers were born. So there were, you know, times when we all lived in motels together. There were times when we all traveled together or there were group houses that everybody lived in. And, you know, my recollection doesn't quite go back that far, but there was definitely an an exciting camaraderie and community of people around us. And um, they sort of treated me as an equal from the time I was six. So I was just kind of like another person in this gang of friends and artists. It was always like a lot of music, a lot of music playing, um, a lot of reggae and a lot of like just kind of great energy coming from the stereo all the time or from dad's acoustic guitar. Can you remember when um, you first realized that everybody's life was not the same as that? Yeah. When was that? There was a time when I was about seven when Damn the Torpedoes came out. And, you know, leading up to that, we really kind of lost dad, like to Jimmy Ivey. And like that, you can see that in a lot of documentaries and stuff where they were literally on the phone day and night or in the studio day and night trying to perfect that record and bring it somewhere. And after that record came out, My father's mother died, and he didn't go to the funeral. And I remember him sitting by the window just looking like just, he just changed, like something changed in him. And I was like, why didn't you go? And he was like, because I'll just be a distraction. I can't go. And distraction because of music or distraction because of other relationships in the family? Because he was famous. Because it was, he would have overshadowed you know, her life as a churchgoer, her life in her community, like the world that they had in Gainesville, which was pretty pure. Was he close with his mom? Very, very. I mean, Kitty, Kitty Avery Petty, our grandmother, Kitty was like magical and compassionate and sweet. And um, I got to meet her before she died a few times and I remember her. But um, she loved my dad. I mean, the sun shined out of my dad and his brother for her and she was a very loving person. But he he changed after she died and Damn the Torpedoes came out. And people started, like, shout, shooting our windows and stuff, like, doing weird stuff in the 80s. Like, and we started having a lot more pe- a presence of, like, security or a presence of handlers or people who cleaned our homes or things like that that just wasn't normal at all. Yeah. And it kind of, I think that kind of got worse and worse, <laughs> you know, like, just in terms of, like, living in the house with them. You know, that feeling of like, wow, the room is getting further and further away and there's an intercom and there's there's all these other people that do basic functions that other people can do for themselves. And I think that there's this sort of mythology that if you're successful, you're isolated from people. You're up a long driveway and other people do all these things that are so annoying to do. But when you stop doing those things for yourself, I think you get really disconnected and aimless about your own existence. Like... You don't understand how much mess you're making around the house or you don't understand what groceries you actually need as opposed to what this random person goes and buys for you. Or, you know, there's just a sort of disconnect that starts to manifest in depression in the successful people that I've grown up around and and with. And um, my dad was so down to earth that we would go to Florida every year and now have no one for a few months and we'd clean our own house and be with my uncle and, and normal people that they grew up with and he would sort of isolate enough with normal people to stay pretty pure cool guy yeah did he enjoy those times particularly? he loved it yeah mm. he loved that and 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 you know there was a lot of songwriting and a lot of inspiration drawn from that time at the beach in florida and we still have that house like that's a really special place i remember when he got it and being really excited about it <laughs> yeah I mean, we had been going there renting for years and like, you know, he was a very pragmatic guy, my dad, you know, he didn't like to live beyond his means. He didn't extend credit. He didn't take mortgages. He just, he liked to keep things simple, but Mm -hmm. things got less simple after he became famous. How much time do you spend on tour when you were really little? All the time. All the time. All the time. 
Did you ever go? We didn't have enough money to take the families with us until the late 80s when my house burned down. And we went on the Dylan Petty tour. Mm. And that's actually when me and Jacob met, was on that tour. And we traveled the world together for most of the year. And we went to Egypt and Israel together. So cool. It was wild. Yeah. I mean, being a um, carny folk or whatever it is that, you know, the child of a musician becomes, you learn how to deal with transitional lifestyle, like living out of a suitcase, having your bag packed every day and unpacking it every night or whatever. Probably not so different from being in the military, like, you know, just being. It's not. And there's a camaraderie and there's a bro code and there's a sort of, um, you know, what, what do we call it? Um, road etiquette. Mm-hmm. That's the word they used with us as kids. Like, you know, you don't walk certain places on stage. You don't trip over wires. You don't get in people's way. If you can help, you help. You know, there's a certain uh, road etiquette to watching a road crew work. And my dad's road crew, you know, he famously had multi-generations of people that would just like replace themselves with their sons. And it was like 40 years of taking care of those people. So once we started going on the road, that road etiquette and that sort of ability to be able to transition into any situation, um, I think for me and some of my friends that have grown up similarly, that has not changed. Like we always like want to be on a plane or like I became a director so I could shoot all over the world and have these little stints and I would be living in a hotel and here I am again. Like it, it's a different it's a different sense of feeling settled, but you can kind of feel settled anywhere, which is kind of a nice gift. Really nice. That sounds yeah. great. Do we know how the house that your dad wrote Wildflowers in burned? Do we know the story of that? It's a crazy story. I can't Do you tell mind telling that story. it? I, I wish I could. Okay. I wish I could. Okay. But the answer is I have suspicions, but I can't. Okay. I can't publicly say them. Okay. I'm curious. I always wondered, like. Yeah, I mean, it was losing a house like you did yeah. is a super emotional thing. And I know a number of men in particular who really took it hard when they lost their family home, where they had their children, et cetera, because I... I think it just is a symbol of something. It's a symbol of really being able to take care of your family. And I think it's, it's a sacred wound. Mm -hmm. It feels really, even if you weren't that attached to the house or whatever, you know, it just feels like you really have the rug pulled out from underneath you. In our case, it became a very important uh, nexus of the journey of my father's career and his life. And without it, I don't believe he would have said he would be a backing band for anyone. I think the necessity of just let's get us on a bus and we'll figure this out. Um, He was at a really interesting point in his career. And I I don't want to get the dates wrong, but it's like post-Southern accents. And they'd gotten really sober. They'd have been in trouble with, with drugs and sobriety before that. And he was sort of reinventing himself and had this opportunity to go out with Bob and have the band really put through its paces in a cool way. And that was the birth of meeting George and the Wilburys coming together and sort of elevating not just the music, but the consciousness and just feeling a certain amount of like, you're not the only one dealing with this, man. It's really hard to be a rock star. It's really confusing. And actually rock and roll has sort of been something on the fringes since the 70s. And this is like, he found found his soulmates through being thrown out into the world and not just staying home. Yeah. And that was, for us, um, that fire was regenerative. It was definitely, it elevated him to the next level as opposed to knocking him down. Yeah. Do you think that those relationships with George and Bob and Jeff were the first time he had that sense of community beyond just the guys in the band? I definitely feel like he had it with certain people. Like there were there were certain magical people to my dad, like Del Shannon or Roger McGuinn, that, that he had really deep connections with musically, but he was sort of reverential to. Like he didn't feel he was on the same footing with. I mean, they were his heroes. And um, and he didn't feel that way about George or Bob or, or Jeff either. I mean, he thought the world of them. He was in awe of them, um, probably until he died, you know. But... Um, he he felt like he was responsible for the band and their families and the crew and keeping the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers organization running. And seeing that other people handled that different ways 
and that they had already gone two decades deep into this experience or him trying to fathom what it was to be a beetle or to live with that sort of scrutiny that Bob had lived with for so long and the intensity. I mean, we saw a lot of crazy people on those tours with Bob and there were bomb threats and there were crazy fans that had changed their last name to Dylan and like figured out how to pull their ID out and sneak into hotels. And like there were, there were sort of like really, really weird people around on that that made our life look like so uneventful. I think it definitely changed Put it in him. perspective. Yeah. yeah. And I think he liked not being the front man for a second. It yeah. gave him a perspective on what a good front man he was in certain ways. And also like just sort of like digging off of, uh, you know, Bob's energy. That, that tour, I mean, I still think as a fan and Jacob too, I think, I think we all feel that that music, it was really important that they made during that tour. And my dad, before he died, one of the last things he took me in the studio and played, because he would always get giddy and take me in the studio and play stuff, was Dylan Petty stuff and them playing with Roger McGuinn and some things that were special from that tour that he had in his archive. But yeah, he definitely changed after that. He saw a bigger, brighter picture, a simpler picture. And I think that that got him to Wildflowers. I mean, that got him to the point of wanting true independence. And there were different stages in that. There was full moon fever as the first step of going, hey, I really am not stuck in this swamp rock world at all. I'm a songwriter and I'm in the car with my kids listening to the top 40. And I, my dad always listened to everything. People would not have believed the kind of influences he had. But I mean, we had an eight track of Yellow, for example. I remember when we were poor, like really poor before Down the Torpedoes in the 70s. And, you know, I remember that ELO eight track going in and snapping into that deck and listening to that until it broke. The thing you mentioned about him um, liking not being the front man for a minute, I got to see the same thing when we did the album with Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah. Where he, he loved being in the band and not having to be the band leader and not having to sing the songs, but just get to make music and play different instruments on different songs and just be in the creative experience with no sense of pressure. You know, he, there was no pressure on him in this because his face wasn't on the cover of that album and he just felt like he was free to just play and he loved it. He loved that project so much. I mean, he loved John. John and June were always around. They were fixtures at shows and would show up and and, and he just loved John so much. And, you know, they're such a special family and such kind people. But I know that when my dad could be a bass player, he would come in from like those Unchained sessions or whatever and like bounce in the room. Like, I got to be the bass player. I'm just playing bass. Like he'd tell you multiple times and he would be so proud that like, hey, I'm free, I'm free. They just tell me when to do things and I do them, you know. And, and I think he felt like that when he worked with the shelters and mentored them. I think he felt like that whenever he got to just sort of like, be a part of something groovy like that. But it wasn't often he would let go of the reins, as you know. Yeah. From the outside, most people think of the, the um, rock star lifestyle as one of excess in terms of parties and people and being out all night. And uh, my experience of him, and I want to ask if this is correct or accurate, but he would watch TV and read and be home. And other than that, he was either on tour or writing music. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he wasn't doing any normal stuff. And he, and he wasn't doing any social stuff. No, I mean, or he, rare. I mean, fr friends, but that's were, all. There were eras of, you know, being social. I think, you know, in the early 80s, the band still all hung out together. All their families would come over. There was still this sort of like camaraderie around us that was very social. But it was um, still just within you guys. It was a very heavily vetted group. I mean, my my dad was married really young. He had kids really young. Um, he had responsibilities a lot of the other guys didn't have. Mike had a daughter a year after him. So, you know, he was in a similar groove. But, um, you know, Jane and Tom did not have normal childhoods where they had sort of a reference for what a normal life would be. 
So, you know, he had a room that he would go in and he would write. And that was like when I was like five years old on Roblar near near Valley Vista where we lived when my dad was probably writing like Breakdown and all those songs or whatever. You know, even in in those times when they didn't have any money, they would sort of make sure they had a little scrappy room. And that discipline was his, that was his sort of practice. Like that was his existence was every day, no matter what, I pour my coffee, I go in this room, I strum this guitar. And would it usually be right when you woke up? Like coffee, it was first thing after coffee? I think it would be like in the afternoon Mm -hmm. when he was like very awake and very like much like through with whatever first impressions of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he, he would be in the room by himself with the door closed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a private process. And even now... How many hours would you say that would typically be? It it would vary. Sometimes he'd go in for a little bit. Yep. And sometimes he'd go in for weeks. Like, you'd just not even see him. Yeah. I remember one time he got really stuck on All or Nothing, which is a song on um, Into the Great Wide Open. It's a really cool song that has a great wailing guitar on it. And... Um, I was just like, God, he's got to solve this one. We've been hearing this song for like months. It's like, and it was, it was like he he was haunted by it, and and it was one of the few where I just saw him like going, oh, I can't figure this out. But he ended up obviously making it into a really beautiful song. But I think that these things they seemed to come easy to him, and he liked them to seem simplistic, and like they came easy to him. But they were so kind of crafted and, and cared about and instinctive and by rote. And he would listen and listen and listen and play until he would get this really sort of essence of something and the soul of something. And then he'd lay it down and know that it was good enough. And I think, you know, his discipline in reading was like amazing. He he read all the time. He watched every film. He watched every classic film, every new film. Um, he was a great lover of art. And had a diverse knowledge of anything he was interested in. And he would go and like get every book on Elvis, every book on JFK assassination, every book on, you know, you know, he never really got to like Google. Like he kind of was like, Google's a little too much for me, but he loved to sit down and just read 300 pages on anything that vaguely interested him. But no, he didn't. In the Wilbur years, they socialized a lot. They went out a lot. Yeah. They pushed boundaries. They tried new things. Yeah. That also might have been Jeff's influence because I think Jeff liked to to be out more. Not Jeff. George. Oh, George? George. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff's like dad. Jeff is like, just wants to be either in the studio or just chilling, you know, I think. I thought he was more of a pub, a pub guy. He might be. I don't know. (laughs) I've never been down the pub with Jeff, but I take him as a pretty serious, um, disciplined creator of music. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Kind of keeps his head in those clouds, you know? That's one of the things that I think really benefited uh, our experience together working on Wildflowers was the fact that he had just worked with Jeff for two albums. Right. Because Jeff was, it seemed to be a real song disciplinarian and got your dad into really good, simple, uh, super well-crafted songs. Not that your dad didn't always have that ability. He always had that ability and would do it sometimes. But with Jeff, it was like, it was always that or it was nothing. Yeah. And um, and there was a side to your dad's music that was more blues-based that, like, if you think of what it was like going to the Fillmore shows, it might not be as song, song, song-based, but more on great musicianship and playing great songs and great grooves and great vibes. And your dad resonated on that stuff too. Yeah. Um, But Jeff really hammered home the, the power of the melody and the concise songwriting. And um, I think the strength of wildflowers is having that kind of rigor in the songwriting influenced by Jeff and then taking off the shackles of that kind of production that Jeff does, which I also love, but it's much more um, perfect. It's less organic. He's a recording artist. He's someone who really, his music is based in studio. Yeah. It's not based in the room. Yeah. But the difference between you and Jeff and the evolution of coming from Jeff to you, which I think is a really interesting part of me discovering Wildflowers and going back through all this stuff, is that... My dad always kind of hid in the heartbreakers. He was always in this sort of like full octane, 
rock band, let's rock, you know? And they just kind of were this incredible sound and they had this incredible shorthand and they all came from the same place and, and they had this thing. And then when he went with Jeff, it was all sort of stripped down and all that technique and all that ability was compartmentalized almost like it was into a computer, right? Mm-hmm. Like it was it was organized through a board, through this like little stems and the process of creating. Much more automated. And this sort of, yeah, you needed a machine in order to execute this vision and this sort of duplicating voices and all of this stuff that makes those big free fallen and I won't back down sounds um, with this beautiful jangle that dad could do. But when you look at Wildflowers, and this is what's so cool about this box set, it seems like the journey was for him to trust you to bring him back to himself. And the poetry of Wildflowers and the song Wildflowers, I believe, is that sometimes what's deep inside of us is just allowing ourselves to be free and and respect ourselves, not to feel shame, to know that our first instincts are the best instincts, and to prioritize ourselves. Prioritize how you feel, because no one else is going to do it. And when you're someone who takes care of a lot of people, and you have a lot of people depending on you, and sometimes you have the hard decision to say, you know what, you can't work for me anymore, and you know that's going to really hurt people or make them you know, not have an income that year or whatever, and they feel like they're part of your tribe. It's really hard to permit yourself to let go of them and do something as honest and pure as he did in the studio with you. And I think looking at it from my perspective, which, you know, is only one perspective and his wives might have a different perspective or somebody else might. We had a pretty close relationship. And it was like, you know, me talking about the Beastie Boys to like a year later, he's sitting in a room with you and... You know, we didn't hear wildflowers along the way much. And he he brought me and my sister to the studio that day for the string recording. And you could tell he was just so proud to show us the mirror of himself here. This is really me, you know. And it was like, oh, wow, this is really you. This is you without the heartbreakers. It was just him and f- what he came up with with his guitar, just a little bit plussed. And he figured out in that process, personally, I'm not going to leave a few things behind here. I'm going to change the personnel in this band. I'm no longer going to be with my childhood sweetheart from high school. I'm going to move on and allow myself a little bit more agency over my own life because I've been saddled with crippling responsibilities since I was 21, you know? And at that point, I was off at college. My sister was older, you know, like he could do that. There was there was room to be able to say, and it wasn't easy, and, it, and it did, there was no snap of the finger. But the songs conveyed the purity of where he wanted to go and where the destination was going to be. And it was the future, and it was magic, and it was falling in love. And it was, it was I'm going to just put some acceptance into this journey and go. And I think that's been... You know, listening to this music, kind of the magic behind it, kind of the bottled sunshine, is that that's real. That's really from him. I never asked him about this, but do you hear anything in the lyrics that from being there, you saw coming from a self-reflective place? Like, are there any of the story of what was going on in his life impactful on the lyrics? There There was one song that I thought was so much cooler in demo form than what ended up being recorded multiple times, which was California. Yeah. And I love that song. The demo is so shit hot. It's so amazing. And it's so much less pop than the final. I love that song too. And I love the super uplifting, like beauty and simplicity of that song. But there's an edge to it in the demo. It has an extra verse and it says, I forgive my past. I forgive my enemy. Don't know if this will last. Guess I'll just wait and see. And it was a level of acceptance going, I'm in this really difficult situation. But my eyes have been open to the fact that things aren't always just conflict for conflict's sake. Sometimes you can be the bigger person and walk away and go, I'm going to reap the bounty of just being able to let this roll off of me. 
And him and Jane fought a lot when we were kids. And they were kids themselves. And I think that he had gotten to a place knowing George and getting to know Yogananda and starting to do transcendental meditation and starting a whole different perspective on life came with George in our lives. And he was such a angel, um, as were his wife and child, who are just angelic and beautiful, magical people too. And that sort of, hey, hey, we don't fight like that. Like, hey, we do that's not, you don't go there. You don't, you don't go to that really gnarly dark place. Even if you're right, just let's make a left turn here and look for forgiveness. Let's look for redemption and forgiving people and being in acceptance of the fact that yes, sometimes things are super messed up and they're not changeable for us, or it's not worth it for us to abandon all our responsibilities to invest in this super messed up thing which I think we've all been through at one point in our lives or another. I mean, and when you are dealing with fame, you're dealing with greed, you're dealing with envy, you're dealing with people thinking that there might be an opportunity for them to grift something. You're also dealing with drugs and you're dealing with mental illness sometimes too. There's all kinds of factors that come into creative communities and fame. And there's this isolation we discussed earlier and they are a perfect cocktail for powerful people to feel really lost and really unable to have any control over their lives. They may seem powerful. They may have a big bank balance. They may own a lot of stuff. They may be the boss of a lot of stuff. But they can't just say, you know what? I'm turning my phone off for three months. Or I'm going to the park with my kid now. They can't do that. They don't have the ability to do that. And I think, I think my dad got to the point where he was like, I want true freedom. <laughs> like, I want freedom from, I don't want to have to make a heartbreakers record. I don't want to have to take care of all these people. I don't want to have to live with someone I'm fighting with all the time. I don't want to have to do that. That would actually be success to me. And I think this record is such a beautiful reflection on making that life decision. I don't even know if I ever heard the California demo. Let's hear the California demo. Let's hear that. So beautiful, right? So beautiful. I don't even know if I ever heard that before. I'd never heard it before. And just the idea that he's saying sometimes you got to save yourself. Yeah. It, it plays right into everything we're talking about. Yeah. Because that's really where he was. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes he would be very attached to a demo and he would bring the demo and he's like, okay, let's learn the demo. And other times it would be... He would have a demo, but it, he would never bring it up, never talk about it, never. And he would just sort of play the guitar, play the song on the guitar for the for the guys, like, okay, this is how it goes. And that was one that I don't remember ever hearing that version before. It's so beautiful. It's it's really special, and I feel like it's like the it's the verse I always felt was missing. Like yeah. I always liked that song, but it it always was like what a goofy song, you know. Yeah. And then when you hear it complete, it's really to me much deeper because. Mm -hmm. California is where he reinvented himself. It's where he left an abusive father behind. It's where he started his own family, surrounded by friends. It's where he had wild success. And him and my mom were tenacious and crazy enough to be successful here and make it work. And I think he had a lot of appreciation for being a resident here. Like he felt very lucky that Los Angeles existed and yet, like you said, he never went out or hung out with anybody. He just really liked like being on his little plot of land and making his art and having the whole machine here to be able to make a living doing what he was good at, you know. And he would reference, you know, living in Reseda. And like there, there were always local references. They were real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ventura Boulevard. Yeah, we lived out there. Yeah. Do, do you know where these were found? Because I remember for a long time the demos were missing. They were in his closet. Amazing. They were there in his closet. Yeah, we pretty much found everything, I think. Amazing. Because I can remember even when he was around, we, nobody could find these. Yeah. Well. <laughs> What's the other demo you suggested we listen to? Oh, I think There Goes Angela would be an interesting one just because you guys okay. never tracked it. Okay. And you might find it interesting. Yeah. Beautiful. Crazy, right? Yeah. Never tracked it. Yeah, I That's no, a demo. I have no memory of it. That's yeah. his eight-track demo mix. Yeah. On the demos, did he have dates on things or no? Sometimes. I mean, no, like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Be like, Checking. Just a, like, demo on it yeah. or something, you know. It's like, I was just wondering when, like, 
the order of events. As disciplined as my dad was, he was still a stoner that didn't label his tapes at times. Yeah. But I think that song's so cool. I think he probably didn't do it because it says, let your heart be free. And it's so sim- similar to the lyric in Wildflowers. So he Maybe. belongs somewhere I think it was like one free. or the other. Yeah. yeah, it's like it was kind of a competing sentiment or something. Yeah. I'm so glad that people finally get to hear it. Me too. Me too. I mean, I one thing I thought was interesting was talking to one of the rock writers that was contributing to our liner notes, Jan Hulinski, and she was saying, he finally gives these girls names. You know, there goes Angela or whatever. It's like, oh, that's really she interesting. was an American girl raised on promises. What was her name? That's really She's interesting. She's a good girl. She loves her mama. Really interesting. Mary Jane had a name, yeah. kind of, but it's a double entendre, right? Yeah. Because we don't know if it's just some yeah. kind bud or a lady. But essentially, the the second half of all the rest coming out and the demos, you start to find names for these girls, like Somewhere Under Heaven, which something he recorded a little later, is talking about Jenny dancing in the rain. I mean, he so rarely gave his characters actual names. Yeah. And I guarantee it was an unconscious change. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We just re-released the You Don't Know How It Feels um, with the line from uh, Crawling Back to You in it. It has the I'm so tired of being tired line in the original demo. And he had kind of pulled it out. That was the first song we recorded for Wildflowers. And we recorded it. The the take that's on the album was Steve Ferroni's tryout to see if if Tom wanted to play with him. Oh wow! Yeah, that's and it so was cool. Like from that from that from that first take from that performance, like oh, this is the guy, and he ended up being the guy until forever. <laughs> You guys were like great perfumery, like a nose or something. You guys were like sniffing out like the perfect vibe, the perfect drummer, the perfect everything. I mean, I I often wonder what it was like for you because at that time, I mean, for some reason you've always seemed like a grown-up to me. I yeah. was like 18 when I, I think I first met you. Yeah. But you were really young, you know, yeah. and you had a lot of responsibility thrust on you really early. And that was a big... I always, I'll tell you that the beauty of working with your dad was he was such an expert that in some ways he was the producer. You know, like, honestly, it's like I, I definitely helped support him in being his best self and doing what I believe his best work. But so much of it, like the things like you guys picked the drummer, he picked the drummer. He almost all of the good decisions that were made were made by him. I guess I allow, you know, allowed the space for him to be his best self without getting in the way. And if anything, supporting him. And, you know, there, there were, there were, it was rare that we even had a, disagreement about something yeah you know i can remember one time we had a disagreement about a line in the song and i told him i I, you know i thought that this line in this chorus was a little weak and he's like you crazy that's the best line in the song it's gotta stay it's like okay (laughs) but that that was the only time i can remember which song was it it was um you wreck me and it was the the line the last line the tagline is yes you do oh right and i thought it's kind of a throwaway. It's like you have four lines to say everything you want to say. Yes, you do. Is like a you're not. There's no content there. <laughs> um, so I thought it was like a waste of real estate. And he was like, "No, that's the whole song." <laughs> His dialect is so interesting to me because uh, he's you know the ain'ts and yeah. the oh yes you do or the oh yeah. hell yes yeah. or the you know the way he would use words and dialect was very um, exciting and very interesting and very pure to him and very much influenced by the way that he grew up. And it's influenced by black culture in the South because his dad had a a supermarket in the black neighborhood in Gainesville and dry goods, and they would be there all day just playing with other kids that worked worked and lived in that neighborhood. But he, uh, you know, like, oh, yes, you do. It's like... It's kind of the throwaway. It's the it's the sort of special sauce. It's the herbs and spices. 
that he would bring to something. Absolutely. Know? I didn't know that that originally was You Rock Me Baby either because I remember he was tr- reading about it in the track by track. He was struggling with trying to find that chorus for a really long time, yeah. apparently. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think he had, it was just called Mike's Song yeah, yeah. for a really for long, a long time. time. Yeah. You know, but then, I remember he was really excited about it. Yeah, it's a really good Tom song. Tom was really excited about it. He's like, this is, and he always said, he's like, Mike always brings in a couple of really good ones, really good ones. And he's like, really good ones that I would not have written otherwise, you know, I would not have done. Yeah, Mike Mike is a very under-recognized, super mega magical songwriter. Yeah, and, and his guitar playing is ridiculous. as good as it gets. Nothing as good better. As it gets. Yeah. No, he's a, he's a magical being. When Wildflowers was originally ma- recorded, we were, in our minds, we were making a double album. And we recorded all the songs with the same belief that these are all, this is all the A material and this is all coming out and this is one big batch. Right. And, um, and I remember your dad, this was your dad's first album for Warner Brothers Records after being unhappily at MCA for a long time. And he had battled with them in the past. Remember, they wanted oh, yeah. to raise the price of the list price of one of his records, and he refused. And then he didn't record for years because, or would refuse to re- refuse to release an album for a couple of years because of the pricing. Um, he was always really uh, wanted to give good value to the audience. To, he cared about his fans. He didn't want to price his material out of anyone's reach same with tickets ticket prices he always wanted to make make it accessible because i think he thought of himself as the person in the audience because he he was for so much of his life until he started doing it until he died he was the fan yeah. until he died he always saw himself as the kid at the record store buying the record exactly. and our responsibility now with carrying on his business which without him making music and making live music is to really protect the fan experience. It's weird. That's something that you almost can't explain to someone yeah. now, yeah. right? When they're yeah. like, oh, we want to capture these emails. We want to do this. Well. And it's like, hey, you know, one reason people really liked him and really liked, you know, transacting with him as an artist was because he wasn't constantly stealing from his fans and he wasn't sort of devaluing or debasing the songs and commercials or making them unspecial to line his own pockets. He wanted to keep them in this really special place. And, um, you know, he did that right down to the very end. He left a lot of money on the table all the time to not be a part of this fabric of consumerism, to make rock and roll a sacred place. And we revere that music. We protect that music. And when you start, you know, making that about hot pants and Pepsi and whatever, you know, it ruins everything. You know, Tim, it was never really like, it was his business, but he never had this like lust for business success. Like he just wanted enough, enough to be able to do fun stuff and, and whatever. But I mean, we weren't like private jet people. We weren't, you know, doing any of that stuff. He didn't need that. And that actually is going to play interestingly into, it's giving me possible insight into a decision that always confused me that he made, which was when we played all of the material of Wildflowers for his new record company, who, who are my friends and who, um, I knew, I knew them before I knew your dad, actually. Mo Austin was the one who introduced me to your dad. I I believe Lenny Warnaker, who was the president of Warner Brothers said, you know, Tom, it'd be better to do a single album than a double album. And that double albums don't sell as well. And that, this is your first album in this new environment and let's do everything we can for it to do its the best that it can do. Yeah. And, and I would, I would have guessed knowing how obstinate your dad was about creative choices. Cause this was a creative choice. I would have assumed he would have said, no, I made a double album. I'm putting out a double album, but instead he said, okay, let's do the single album. And, Maybe also part of that, and relates to what we were just saying, is that for the fans, it's half as expensive. You yeah. know, it's like it's a, it's a more realistic, and that's the reason double albums don't sell as well, is because they're more expensive. That would have resonated with him for sure. 
for sure. I never made that connection before just now having this conversation. Yeah, me either. Because mm-hmm. it always seemed like that's not like him. To not to fight go, for the to creative. To go along. Right, to right. Go, to go along with anything. Right. <laughs> you know, this is not like <laughs> well, him. Well, no, sometimes he would. But, I mean, he, you know, he was obstinate about the art. And yeah. you guys, this, I still wish if we go in a time machine, I'd sit down and beg him to put the double album out. <laughs> because I still can't find that original double album sequence. I've found versions, but I can't. Yeah find the one he played for me and my uncle and that I had in my car at college. But it was never, I know? will tell you honestly, it was never firmly established of these are the songs and this is the double album. It, it never got that far because the, the, the choice to make it a single app and album happened before we really got to sequencing. So there, were, there may have been, and there, was prob- there were probably multiple sequences that we were listening to as possible ways to go. He had a, he, you know how my dad had his notebook? Yeah. Like he'd start a record and he'd do all the songs in that same notebook. And then he'd have like a legal pad that he'd start and he'd write down everything to remember things like dumb things. There'd always be like a coffee ring and like gross stuff all over it on the front page. And then he'd like go through it. And he had a sequence. He had a sequence for the double album. And he had these gold discs made and he had sent them back east to me and to my uncle. And we had them. And what I would give to have not thrown that on the floor of my car as a 18-year-old. But I um, I listened to it all the time. And it was half, you know, hung up and overdue and songs that had ended up on She's the One. But really, a lot of it was all the rest, which we're putting out now. Yeah. And it ended with Girl on LSD. That's all I remember. We both remember that was the last track. That was the sort of like joke at the end of the Odyssey, yeah. you know, to lighten up Wake Up Time or whatever. But I wish it had been a double album that he had sequenced because he was so good at sequencing and he cared so much about telling a full story yeah. and balancing a beautiful album side. And yeah. he spent a lot of time on the timing between songs and the, you know, in mastering the the way each song level-wise came after the song before it. And there was a lot of detail going into that final phase of crafting the the sequenced album. Yeah, and the keys that the last song ended in and the key that the next song's beginning in, him and Mike. Mike's always like, just go to the back end and the front end and let me hear that. You know, but I think... We would do both. We would do that. It was called the Tops and Tails, and we would make it on tape. On, you know, uh, at that point it was half inch tape and there would be the last 30 seconds of a song and then the first 30 seconds of the next song yeah. of the whole album. Yeah, they had a, a toolbox they had learned. I think, I really think making Damn the Torpedoes was such a like huge learning experience for Jimmy, for Dad, for Mike, for Stanley, for all of those guys. It was like, no, this is real now. This is not just like you're at the whiskey and you're cool as hell and young as hell. And all the, it was like, this is real discipline times is recording process for you. And the pre Jeff, right? Yeah. They're all learning. Yeah. What are the criteria for what we think is actually really good? Yeah. Really good recording of our playing, really relevant, really of the moment. And how do we tell this story? And there were, you know, it was just the normal noises in here. You hear Marcy Campbell in the shower, or you could hear like, tapes speeding up and slowing down and that sort of Beatles influence, which later you brought back in, actually, by bringing in the off-white um, demos to Dad before you started Wildflowers. But, like, it's that sense of going on the ride with the record. You turn on the record, you want to listen to the whole damn thing, you want to be on that ride with my dad, likely in your car, you know, and just kind of hear the whole thing from beginning to end and trust him, even if there is a little lull or a little song. We mixed the album in the car because we would work on the mix in the studio and then we would go out and it was um, Richard Dodd had rented a little Toyota, tiny little Toyota. And um, that became the reference sound system for this album. (laughs) And we would sit in the car and if it didn't sound good in the Toyota, the mix was not done yet. And... We'd be running in and out all day, <laughs> just car test, car test, car test over and over again. Yeah. It was never work. It wasn't a, a job. I mean, it was he a job in that he had to show up at, at a concert when it was booked. But it was always, the creative process always stimulated him. And it seemed like it was the most important thing in his life. 
It was, and so were those shows. Yeah. He practically died on stage. I mean, he he wanted to be there communing with people and connecting with them and lifting the vibration. And he knew, my dad wasn't a perfect person by any means, but he knew he had this power. Like, you could walk up to my dad, and if he would smile at you, there was no way you were having a bad day. There was just no way. Like, he he could light you up with a look, you know, and... He wasn't the most attractive man on the planet. He wasn't the most this or that or the other, but he had a lot of soul. Like he had this really dynamic soul and he protected things that allowed for soul. He was just so awesome. It's so hard um, to have to sit here and speak about what he may or may not have done or thought or whatever, because I don't really know. But really what he put into me as a father was be on time, be prepared, be creative, feed your brain, always look for more art. And and he got to a point after the internet came, you know, where he was just like, you know what, Adra, like, I really just want to watch Turner Classic movies and I want to listen to the radio and do my radio show. And now I'm rediscovering new and uh, old bands and new bands that I'm really turned on by. And he would feed the well with only this really, really good information. And take all of the rest away. I mean, he didn't really take a lot of negativity and noise into his diet. He he anything he could avoid at, at the point, real early in his career, so that he could keep communing with that soul. Yeah, you know. So, um, which other songs are we going to listen to? We should um, talk about something could happen, maybe. Okay. Okay. Would that be cool? Yeah, let's okay. hear a little bit of it at least. Okay, here's something could happen. So cool. What does it bring up for you? It's uh, something can happen. I mean, it's such a great, like, look at the contradictions in my dad. Like, the artist side of all of us is full of contradictions, and it's full of messiness, and it's full of all of these subconscious thoughts and things, influences on us coming out on the page or into the, uh, the instrument the, of your choice. And, you know, I'm sure of who I am unless I feel like somebody else, you know. It's, I'm not easy to know, you know. It's like, it's hard for him to get to know himself. Yeah. It just, it plays more into these themes of mm-hmm. the self-discovery. And it's like. I mean, the line like I was torn in two is a, is a brutal line. And it's sung so beautifully <laughs> that 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 you don't you know that that's that's a really heavy thing to say. I was torn in two, but I actually know I'm going to heal. Yeah. I actually feel this sense of hope. Yeah. I actually feel this yeah. possibility. It's it's interesting to me, you know, just sitting here with you and thinking about the antecedent to this record being Echo, where it was like, okay, I'm not going to make it. This is just too much to bear. This yeah. change has been too much upheaval for me. Yeah. And I'm a sensitive soul, you yeah. know, and there's, there's was this Was Echo sort of, next? Echo was next. Wow. Feels like a world apart. They were completely different universes that he was living in at that yeah. time. And yeah. Echo was a very isolating post-divorce moment for him. Yeah. Um, but. I remember also he was going through some personal dark stuff apart yeah. from all that. He oh, was, yeah. Yeah, he was definitely using drugs at that time and, yeah. and alone and, and, and he struggling. Did, he, he often didn't seem like himself. Like he seemed like a different character arriving. No, he wasn't himself. Yeah. There was no Maybe he home. was walking with a cane and wearing dark glasses. It was a very unusual time. He was not He was not in a good place. And I think he has so many, I mean, regrets about that era of his life. He had just descended into such a dark place, but... You can see, he could see it could go that way. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this song. He's like, hey, things could get really weird. Yeah. Or maybe they'll just be great. Yeah. You know, but they did. They got weird. Um, and then they got much better. Yeah. Much, much better. Yeah. Um, thanks to many good friends like you and other people. But one thing I can't, I should know, but I can't remember what we decided to put in the lyric sheets. But I, I think he says, I walked the mall, come home and fall down. Like, like a guy that goes to the mall. Do you wow. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, they they were sort of arguing with me back in at the ranch saying, oh, it's walk them all. Like I walk all the streets or something like that. But I think he's saying I walk them all, go home and fall down. I wonder, which I don't know. For him would be kind of 
like normal because he thinks of that as the normal American experience, you know? Like, I'm just, what would a normal guy that's not Tom Petty that actually gets in his car when he's bummed out and go and do yeah. or whatever. In the free fallen video, he's riding the escalator he's in, in the, the mall. mall. Right, yeah. exactly. Which is why I had them draw like a little guy in an astronaut's outfit walking through a, a, a shopping mall, um, you know, with the, with the words, I'm not easy to know, because I thought that was so like him. You know, he would have been like, this, I stick out like a sore thumb here. I've never been to a mall except in my music video, you <laughs> know. How unrealistic, you know. But um, he was so proud of the song. Like, when he found these tapes and rediscovered um, all the rest and wanted to put this out as, you know, first Wildflowers 2, then he talked to you and decided to call it All the Rest. Um, this was the song that was sort of like that Christmas that he dragged my uncle into the studio to listen to. And this was the song that he really thought was an undiscovered piece of magic for him. It's so interesting that we had the second half of this amazing album and because we just moved forward making new stuff, we just sort of forgot that. It's almost like we forgot it existed. It's amazing. I think you guys were so focused at the time based on me going back and talking to everybody that you were so in the moment of creating at the highest level on each track you were finishing for Wildflowers, including these tracks, which you obviously got to a finished place. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's it's amazing how um, when you're, like, I've experienced this on a very low level as a director, when you have this great crew around you and you all are aiming at the same thing and everyone on the crew is elevating it. There he had the perfect environment. He was accepted. He had a younger producer that respected him, but he had respect for you because he didn't know your world. And he knew you were of the current world. And you were his ambassador to the current world. And you gave him permission to be himself. This is the beauty of this stuff to me, is that you two had that connection. And, you know, I've I've known you for years, and I, I know how he's spoken about you. And it's not like you guys were like, tell me all your deepest, darkest, like, secrets, or you were, like, the closest friends of all time that know everything about each other and each other's families. It was a real deep mutual respect and a dialogue of, yes, trust yourself. Here, let's think about it. You know, you were this really magical barometer for him. He really enjoyed it. I knew the whole time he was with you. He just enjoyed it so much. We had fun. We had fun. And it was, again, it was like, um, and and I'll say, while it was hard and long, because while Wildflower sounds like it was recorded in a weekend, it was two years, I think, of, of, gr- of grueling labor trying to make it sound like we weren't trying so hard. Uh, Rick, it does not sound like it was recorded in a weekend. It sounds pretty masterful but and amazing. I feel amazing. like it has a casual sense about it. It's, it's casual if being casual is being absolutely perfect, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's not perfect like Jeff's records. Like Jeff's records are really perfect. It's different. It's a different thing. There's more <laughs> oxygen in the room. There's it's just more different. oxygen it's in the room. It, it feels born of the miking, the live recording, and really selectively overdubbing, but really kind of you were able to go, man, I've got players I don't need to overdub so I can do live recordings. Yeah. I mean, And it really was about taking the time to get the performances and the starkness and the truth in those performances. That's Everything was rooted in that. Yeah. A pleasure speaking to you. Such a pleasure for me. Thank you so much. You're the and, sweetest. Um, again, thank you for protecting this art and uh, sharing it with the world in a new way and, and uh, expanding people's experience of this beautiful music. Oh, it's, it's an a honor and a privilege. Magic time. Magic time in my life. It was a magic time to be on the very far periphery of it. And it is just such an honor and a privilege to be an ambassador for you and for dad and for the band. And I'm so overjoyed to bring it to people at a time when I think they really need it. And there's a lot of love and understanding and beauty in this music that will carry people and uplift people. And I think that that's the most exciting part for us. Thanks to Adria Petty for sharing memories of her dad with us. You can hear Wildflowers and all the rest, along with our favorite Tom Petty and the Heartbreaker songs, on the playlist at brokenrecordpodcast.com. 
Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash broken record podcast. There you can find extended cuts of past episodes along with new ones. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and is executive produced by Mia LaBelle. Our theme music is by Kenny Beats. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like Broken Record, please remember to share, rate, and review our show on your podcast app. I'm Justin Richmond.